um, take the non-participants off of video for now. So you can see all your panelists on the screen. Non-participants off of video for now. Ooh, echo. Uh, <laughs> so it's probably coming from one of your one of your computers, was it? Oh, wait, maybe it's not. <laughs> so it's probably coming from one of you. There. Oh. All right. Okay. Whoever just muted it made it work. I made it stop. So welcome, everybody. We're going to get started in a few minutes. Um, we're just going to wait and see if we get a few more people. So maybe 7.05. I'm Emily. I'm one of the librarians with the Los Angeles Public Library. Um, and we are looking forward to chatting with this great group of uh, television writers and producers and executives today. So it's very exciting. I see so many people I know. Hi guys. <laughs> <laughs> did you, just, Amanda, did you just get married recently? I did. I got, well, I got married, it's about two years ago, but, um, but I know, <laughs> time gone. I know. <laughs> That's okay. recent in Hollywood, right? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I'm also checking my email just to see if anybody's emailing like, what's the Zoom link? Where is it? You know, so <laughs> you're gonna check check there. Got a couple. Only 37, but every time I have to use Zoom, I feel like I've aged like 35 <laughs> years. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I just got word that we're live on all channels. Uh, so I guess I'll get started. Um, I'll continue to you know let people in as they come in. Um, if you have any trouble, then you know do let me know. Um, we're going to have everybody muted who is not one of our panelists today and also have your cameras off for the time being. Um, just that way it keeps it, you know, to the to the, the panelists on the screen, which is really nice. I'm Emily. I am normally the adult librarian at the Studio City Branch Library, and this program, Women in Television, was meant to be in the branch. Um, obviously, we had to reschedule, and we are so happy that everybody was able to reschedule with us today. So we have a great group of people here. I did want to make a couple of announcements first about library resources. So here's my handy Los Angeles Public Library card. Um, and if you don't have your library card and you live in Los Angeles County, you can actually get an, uh, access to your digital resources instantly by going to lapl.org and signing up for your e-card. And those digital resources not only include your books and audiobooks and research material, but they also include music and movies and television shows. Um, we have a service called Canopy Streaming that has access to a lot of documentaries and art films and foreign films. Um, Digitalia also has access to films. Hoopla Digital has a lot of movies and TV shows. It even has the Acorn TV shows on it. Um, and it also has, I mean, this is not related to women in TV, but it has a really great Broadway collection. So if you're a Broadway musical fan, I recommend Hoopla as well. Um, and feel free to reach out to your librarians um, and ask them about the digital resources because we're happy to help. We also have a lot of events still taking place all virtually right now. And you can see those on lapl.org on the website. I know that our branch is coordinating um, author interviews every Tuesday and Thursday at 4 p.m. over on Instagram Live. We're doing these short things called the Studio City Author Scoop. So if you wanna join us for you know, 15, 20 minutes, that's every Tuesday and Thursday at three. And there are plenty of other things going on as well. So with that, I don't wanna take up too much of your time because we have such a great panel today. So I wanted to uh, turn things over to our moderator, Amanda Bowman Garish, who is um, going to introduce herself and then let the panelists introduce themselves as well. And if you have any questions, you can put them in the chat. I'll also put my email address in the chat just in case you know something gets goes wrong and you get knocked off and I will help you get back on. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much, Emily. I'm very, very excited to be here with all of these powerful women to talk about uh, being creative during the middle of this you know, pandemic. Um, <laughs> uh, that's all we really want to do right now is escape into creative worlds. And, uh, you know, we've got the experts here that can kind of talk about their experiences and what it took for them 
to cut through a very competitive industry. Um, my name is Amanda Bowen Garish. I'm a vice president at Entertainment One, uh, which was recently purchased by Hasbro. So expect some really compelling uh, toy TV coming at you very soon <laughs> with a lot of strong women. Um, but uh, let's, I'm gonna step aside and I'm going to let each one of the panelists introduce themselves. Um, so why don't we start with Janika James and Jashika James? Hi, Hi everybody. <laughs> I'm Jashika, and I'm Janika, and we are, um, well, we were supervising producers on Empire, which was just the series finale just aired um, um, this past week, and we are currently uh, writing on a new Netflix show. We're co-EPs on a new Netflix show, um, and I started off working for a woman named Yvette Lee Bowser, started off in comedy on a TV show called Half and Half on UPN. If anybody remembers when uh, UPN and the WB were two separate networks, <laughs> and um, Jashika started in, I started um, off at uh, in my writing career. I started off as a writer's assistant on a show on ABC called Revenge. Amazing! We're gonna dig into all of that. Uh, Ms. Yeah. Latoya Morgan, uh, please introduce yourself. Hi everybody, uh, Latoya Morgan. I was a co-executive producer on Into the Badlands, um, also co-EP on Turn, Washington Spies, and currently a consulting producer on The Walking Dead. Awesome. Uh, also like to introduce Holly Overton. Hello, um, I was most recently a supervising producer um, on the CBS All Access drama, Tell Me a Story. Um, and I worked on Shadow Hunters and Cold Case previously. Um, I also um, write in my spare time, I also write novels. Awesome, we're gonna get into that. Uh, Gladys Rodriguez. Um, hi, I'm Gladys Rodriguez. Um, let's see, I started off uh, my writing career on Sons of Anarchy. Um, and then I did, um, what else did I do? I just recently was the co-EP on Vida. Um, which my episode airs on Sunday, you guys should watch, last season. Um, and right now I am actually working with Janika and Jashika on the Netflix limited series. Amazing. Yeah. Uh, next we've got Liz Scudlow. Hello, um, I'm Liz. I, for those of you, I don't know, if ever, does everyone know what type, our titles mean? I'm a, so I'm also a co-executive producer, but all these titles mean that we're all writers. Um, for those of you who don't know, the very complicated title uh, world of television. Um, and I am currently on Dynasty on the CW, but I've written for um, Jane the Virgin, The Following, Switched at Birth, 90210, um, MTV comedy called Awkward. Um, and I've sold a lot of pilots that you've never seen because none of them made it to TV. <laughs> Which is a very, very hard thing to do. <laughs> so congrats to that. Uh, next is Tessa Lee Williams. Hi, I'm Tessa. I'm a supervising producer on the CW show Riverdale. And um, I'm also uh, co-writing a pilot for HBO Max currently. Um, and then uh, before, like uh, other stuff that I've done, I did, um, I wrote Snapchat's first scripted uh, series. So we made that a show, which was super fun. And we developed that into a pilot for Netflix last year, uh, which was really cool. Awesome, thank you so much, you guys. Um, I'm gonna start with a hard and probing question. Um, I would love for you guys to describe the lightning bolt moment that really resonated with you and why you really wanted to show accurate and equal representation on television. Um, it could be when you were younger, it could be while you were kind of dabbling in the industry and, and really defined your career in a certain manner. Um, so Janika and Jashika, why don't we start with you? Yeah, um, it's interesting. I think we kind of have two. I mean, I mean, I, I can talk about the younger one, and you can talk about the one later with um, um, Erica. So, okay, so when we were, um, <laughs> I think we were thirteen years old mm -hmm. when it was when um, the TV show Living Single was on Fox. Um, and if you guys have never heard of Living Single, go to Hulu, I believe. Um, mm -hmm. You can really check it out. Some amazing, incredible television about women. Um, and it was it was just one of our favorite shows growing up. And I remember being in uh, eighth or ninth grade and 
um, coming across a magazine. It was an Essence Magazine article. And we had always loved TV. Like we were military brats. We lived in Germany for four years and our grandparents would send us like VHS tapes of, you know, American shows. And we would just sit in front of the TV all day. And my mom thought something was wrong with us because we wouldn't go play outside with other kids. But we were, you know, just obsessed with television and growing up and watching Living Single, it was something that we just, you know, wanted to watch every Thursday night. And there were, you know, four different black women and they just, you know, they were just very, um, um, just different types of women. You know, we had, you know, Queen Latifah, you know, who played, you know, the entrepreneur Khadijah. We had Erica Alexander who played, you know, the lawyer Max, you know, and we had um, um, Kim, uh, Kim Fields who, you know, was Regine, you know, <laughs> bougie. bougie and, you know, you know, all about, you know, you know, her men and her hair and things like that. And then, you know, Kim Coles who played, you know, Sinclair. And it was just, it was cool to see uh, um, a range of African-American women in TV and um, not just, you know, just di different types of women, just in terms of how they represented themselves, but also women who look different, who didn't look like, you know, like just the typical skinny, you know, woman that you see, you know, presented in television or in any medium, essentially. And I remember coming across the Essence Magazine article and reading about the woman who created Living Single. And it was so, you know, impressive and incredible, I think, for us to see that it was a Black woman who, at 27 years old, had created her own TV show. And I think that was like the lightning bolt moment for me and Chica, because we always knew that we were obsessed with TV, but we did not know that, oh, you could be behind, you the, could be behind the scenes, you, you, you could actually create be, a show. You could be responsible for, you know, these, these characters, you could be responsible for what's coming out of these people's mouths. Like, oh, that's like so cool. Oh, and it's a, it's a woman and, it's, and for us in particular, it's a black woman. It was like, wow, like this is something that we can actually do. So I think reading about Yvette in that Essence Magazine article was the thing that kind of, that was the the little bit of the a light light switch. It, it took us a while to actually get to actually pursuing this as a career, but that was the the first seed I think that was planted for yeah. us. Um, the second moment that she referenced was when we um, and she probably will, will not remember this. We met Al Erica Alexander, okay. yeah, and it was Kim it was Cole's it was birthday. Kim Cole's birthday party. Yep, mm -hmm. random how that happened. Mm -hmm. But we met her, and I remember she asked us. She's like, "Oh, what do you guys do?" I'm, I'm like, "Oh, I work, you know, at the studio, but I." Um, I, you know, we're aspiring writers. And yeah. she said, hurry up ladies, cause we're waiting on you. Mm -hmm. And yeah. that was very like, like it was one of those moments where it was just like, Ugh. like, oh, okay. All right, okay. All right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think as, you know, as writers, I think, you know, and for, you know, for us, we'd always been trying to, you know, just, we're like, we can write anything, we can write anything. But it was talking to her as an African-American actress um, and when she said, hey, we're waiting on you guys to write for us, that really kind of just kind of spoke to us. You know, there, it, it, it gave us, I think, a sense of responsibility that we didn't necessarily always have in the back of our mind in that moment. So that was pretty incredible. That's incredible. And that's really special. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thanks for sharing that, guys. <laughs> Latoya, you're up. Wow, yeah, I didn't have a, a cool like interaction with Erica Alexander, who is amazing, um, and Yvette, who's a phenomenal trailblazer. Um, and definitely, if you have not seen Living Single, please get to Hulu because it is so, so, so good. Um, for me, it was more rage um, <laughs> because when I was a kid, the thing that I really loved was science fiction. So. Part of my childhood was just growing up watching, they used to run the Twilight Zone Marathon during 4th of July. Mm. So for me, like one of my favorite memories as a kid is just, you know, having barbecue and then watching that marathon and being really afraid of like talking Tina the doll and uh, just loving Rod Serling and his stories and then seeing the credits and, and really looking up that stuff and noticing, first of all, there's no women <laughs> and there's definitely not any black women. And so uh, those were the influences. Like if you see behind me, the poster that's on my wall is the X-Files. Um, and again, no, no women in the writer's room and uh, uh, definitely no people of color. And so, uh, I, well, there's one, James uh, Wong. But uh, I think that was what drove me is really being drawn to these stories that were sort of fantastical and science fiction and genre driven and not seeing any representation and me just being really stubborn, being like, I know I could write those types of stories. I wanna be at that table. 
and really fighting to do that. That's awesome. That's, that's incredible. Um, Holly, you're up next. You've got an interesting spark, I'm assuming, from the transition from books to television. Well, you know, I actually started writing books after I was writing TV and it was sort of a response to, um, I think like it was a response to like an agent actually telling me that my work was too narrow because it was about women. Um, and uh, my uh, TV agent who is thankfully not my TV agent anymore. And, um, and I just, but like when I was younger, you know, I grew up in Texas and you know, obviously it's very enmeshed in the patriarchy. And I think like, like you never even kind of realize like how much your thoughts are sort of defined by like where you grow up and how, you know, and I was raised by a really strong single mother, but I was, I, I still just sort of like, I, and I never at the time when I grew up in Texas was like, I'm gonna be a TV writer. Like I didn't have like, oh, this is what I wanna do. I wanted to be an actor. And then I ended up in, in you know, New York. And then I came out here to act. And when I got into writing, it was almost like just like survival was like my thing of like getting the next job, getting on the show. And then I started getting on shows where we had all these incredibly talented women, but none of them were in charge and none of them were making decisions. And you can have 10 women on staff, but if there's one man deciding and he doesn't um, think that like you're, you're ten, the 10 women in the staff are valid, their viewpoint is valid, like they're not gonna listen. And so kind of like Latoya said, I think some of it was rage of like female driven stories and just wanting like I always wrote female driven stories. I always wrote stories with like different perspectives. And so to me, that was really important. But I, I was on a show once where lots of women in the room. And I remember one time, like the showrunner who was a new showrunner said to me like, oh, you're that woman in this room. And I was like, <laughs> you already know you're doing something wrong if you have to tell a writer that. But I was like, yes. And I will. And I don't care. I will forever be that writer. Like, even if it, you know, if it doesn't always make me friends, like, I just like, I feel like I have a, a and, and like, I also just want to like, show it to that agent who's like, your writing's too narrow. It's not because like, we're half the population and we should have a voice. Yeah. Amen. I love that. Uh, Gladys Rodriguez, would love to hear yours. Um, you know, I think my the reason I wanted to get into this industry and be a TV writer is because I didn't see myself represented as a kid um, and I still don't. So I, I feel like there, there was a need. Um, I didn't realize that back then. I just, I was like a total TV nerd. I used to love like 90210 and, you know, Melrose Place. And I was like, that's, I want to do that, you know? Um, and I think it wasn't until I actually saw um, myself represented in movies more. Um, I, I was watching Real Women Have Curves. Um, it's like an independent film. And I mean, I totally saw myself in this like chunky Latina. Um, and sorry, America, but that, that's who it was, you know? And I was like, dude, like, I really want to do this. Like, I want to write features so that girls like me could see themselves. Um, and so, and then I, I watched Selena and it changed my life. And so I was like, okay, I really want to work for Gregory Nava because he's the director. So I, when I got to LA, um, I looked him up in like the Hollywood production guide or something that we, we used to have back then before the internet. <laughs> it was, we had the internet, but we had this like fat book. It was like the Hollywood production guide. And I looked him up, I called him up and I said, you know, my dream is to, to work for you because like, you changed my life. And um, he, I think one of his assistants was like, yeah, come on in for an internship uh, for, to, for, to, you know, apply for an internship or whatever. So I, I went and I interviewed and I actually got the job uh, on the spot. And so it was um, from then on, I was like, okay, I'm really determined to, to, to write for women, especially Latina women. And so I could actually see myself represented. And so other girls like me could see themselves represented. And so, but it, it's been a long journey um, and it's been really hard because, you know, I haven't had that power in the room um, until now, you know, it's, I've been in this industry since 2002, uh, working my way up, but um, until I was on Viva this last year, um, did I actually have uh, some power because we, I helped, um, I helped run the room with Tanya Sriracho and we, it was an all that next female uh, writer's room and we actually had you know, um, power to like tell our stories. And so that's kind of like what I want to keep doing. Um, I want to keep telling stories so that, you know, women like me could, could see themselves and, and, and it's still a struggle. I mean, we, we still aren't represented. So, you know, that's, that's the goal is just to keep doing it. And then hopefully, um, 
sell more shows so more people could see it. Definitely. Amazing. Uh, Liz, you're up next. Put me on. Um, well, I guess I'll preface it with I'm a straight white woman, so I'm on TV a lot. There's a lot of women who are straight and white on television. Um, and so I don't, I don't want to say that I grew up with a lack of representation. Many of the women on television were not uh, people to look up to or, or fleshed out and, you know, strong women. But I, I think I've been very lucky in that, um, you know, even like the Babysitter's Club was huge the year that I was their age. And it was for spunky businesswomen, most of, most of whom are white. Um, you know, starting their own business and learning how to run it and being given agency. And then um, Buffy came on when I was in sixth grade and it ended when I was a senior in high school. And man, if I didn't cancel every single Tuesday night event so that I could sit on my couch and watch Buffy because being able to sit and watch a, just a kick-ass, empowered, um, tortured high school female meant the world to me. Um, you know, and then later Veronica Mars came along. And so um, I think I've been very lucky in that... Uh, there have been stories written with uh, that I was the audience for for, uh, for most of my life. Um, and then I've also been very lucky because I, uh, my career started on 90210 where I worked for four different female showrunners. Um, Jane the Virgin was run by Jenny Ehrman, another powerful woman. I've had, um, I've only had one experience where I was in a room that, that was more men than women. Like Holly, I was sort of, they were like, oh, here's the fem the angry feminist. And I was like, I just asked if we could not have all the women naked in every scene. Um, and they were like, oh, she's so mad. She's such a feminist. Okay. Um, you know, so it, I, but I, um, I think I've been very, really lucky because I've been able to craft my career um, in such a way that I've stayed on a lot of CW shows. I want to give them a shout out because they, um, for more than five years now, have won the diversity scorecard both on screen and off screen they have the most diverse shows consistently they have the most diverse uh writing staffs and showrunners they have more female showrunners than any other network so i've managed to like carve this little um like female utopia uh for myself so i don't actually know what the real world is like um but i will say i i did an interview recently for the la times um about fat representation on tv uh which is different but also an issue and um sort of looking at shows like this is us where everyone gets very fully fleshed out storylines but kate only gets to be fat um and i will say the a moment where i felt really um just uh, that felt really different for me in my career is i i sold a, a pilot to tbs a couple years ago um and it was a show that had a fat protagonist that wasn't about her being fat she was just like a dumb slutty drunk 20 something who happened to be fat, but who got to live real stories. Um, and I will say like, I, it was the one time in my career that I've ever been eligible to write a fat person where it wasn't the butt of a joke or it wasn't um, about an eating disorder or it wasn't about, um, you know, just size and discrimination. It was just a story where, where a woman happened to be fat and that's who she was. And, you know, 67% of the US is over size 14. Um, so that's most of America. Uh, and so, yeah, so I don't know. So I, I think um, I want to just acknowledge my privilege because I, uh, I feel very passionately about putting strong women on TV, but I realize that I've had as a straight white woman more, more access to seeing women who resembled myself. Um, and I work hard to, to amplify other voices that are, uh, that, that are not as well represented, um, including other fat people. <laughs> That's amazing. Thank you so much, Liz. Uh, Tessa, you're up next. Um, you know, similarly to I think what um, a lot of people are saying is um, I feel like uh, I have a couple of moments that kind of come to mind. Um, and I don't think they were like probably the defining moment that sort of made me want to get into this in representation, but they are ones that I like, even though they seem kind of like really small, they're ones that I like keep going back to and kind of like can't let go of. And they both come from kind of a place of rage as well. I mean, the first one, again, feels small, but like, I remember I was in college and I um, was going to see, I went to see a movie with my boyfriend and his father. Um, it was like over summer vacation. And um, I just remember that the the female protagonist sort of when she was, it was a male led film, but the, you know, there was a, it was a, 
kind of a two-hander. And the female protagonist, when she was introduced, it was just, I'm not going to like go into details about it, but it was like in such an absurdly objectified, like made my skin crawl kind of way, um, which was just, and it was just, it was just it was so unapologetic. Like, I feel like it was the first time that I had seen one that was like quite that in your face. Um, and it was like 10 minutes into the movie and I almost had to leave the theater. I was like so filled with rage. Um, and I didn't because I had was like meeting my boyfriend's dad for the first time and was like trying to make a good impression. But I sat there just like digging my nails into my hands. And I remember afterwards, like I couldn't, fo- I couldn't, focus on the movie at all like I hated everything about it from that point forward and I remember going out in the parking lot and they just loved it they loved the movie um they like couldn't understand kind of like why I was so upset and it was just this moment of like this is this is insane this is insane and the fact that like you don't even know what I'm talking about um makes me makes me just as angry kind of and so that was uh a moment that's I just it's like constantly sort of rattling around in my brain um, when I think about uh, women characters in TV and film and media. Um, the other one was a little later. I had a script that I had written, um, just like a spec script that I had written um, that was sent around. And more than once, it was about a uh, sexual assault survivor. And more than once, I got the feedback of like, we just don't think she's likable enough. And I, to like care that she had sort of gone through this traumatic event. And it was, I mean, it was just, I still sort of like don't have words kind of when I go to talk about it. Um, But those are kind of the two that stick out in my mind of things that like continually, things that happened a long time ago that continually sort of like drive me kind of every day um, and remind me why I feel so strongly about sort of being in this business and writing the characters that I'm writing and the stories that I'm telling. Rage is a very powerful uh, mechanism for change. And I think oh, that's yeah. why we're all here and we're all in this business. Um, and I think the next question I want to ask, and I can either go around or you guys can raise your hands, whichever you would like, uh, whichever you think is, is best. If someone wants to raise their hand, please do. Um, is speaking to that rage, you know, for me, I've had moments in my career where I was confronted with a choice and even the words that came out of my mouth surprised me. So I guess the question is, was there ever a moment where you either said yes or no to something or you made a decision that really surprised you that you look back on your career and go, thank God I did. Um, I can start with uh, Janika and Jashika again, and, and but if anyone else wants to, to answer, please jump in. What are you talking about at the beginning of our careers or? I'm um, really any, anywhere. I mean, for me, it was uh, an opportunity working at, at ABC Family and I had to take a chance. And there was a Pretty Little Liars was a script. It was not picked up to pilot it. And uh, I was given, I, I didn't get the promotion, um, but they, they gave me a choice. They were like, you can either work on this show or, or you can either uh, you can pick any show that you want to be the third executive on. and we had a lot of shows in production and I said, I'm going to pick Pretty Little Liars because my gut said that like everything you're speaking to, you know, we're showing LGBT representation. Um, There's a big concept so we can just explore all these fabulous characters. So that that's where the question kind of comes from. Uh, Even if you're young, if if you were in a room and someone said something that that you had to say no to and, and, um, and, um, I'll actually, I'll answer that. I actually, you know, I actually left a, a show that I was on because I really felt like, like my voice wasn't heard and like the representation that we were doing and and I just didn't feel, I just didn't feel good about being there. And I w- was walking away from a lot of money and it was walking away from like, you know, job stability if I, you know, wanted to go back. Um, but I really felt like, and you know, I said to my husband, like, I can't do, I, like, you know, cause it's a, it's a, you know, it's, a household decision and it was just such a great decision because I wrote a pilot like I just took some time off and wrote a pilot that got me you know all the next jobs and got me a lot of interest and so I think it's just one of those things of like kind of trusting your gut and not being afraid to take a risk that could seem like you know especially because there is so much uncertainty in this business that to like walk away from something that's a sure thing um but I've never I never once regretted it so I think it's just like that kind of thing of like 
yes, we're lucky we get to do these jobs. And like, I know how privileged I am that I get to do this, but also like if you're doing a job that makes you feel bad about who you are or the stories you're telling or how you're telling these stories, then you definitely shouldn't keep doing it. Yeah, I guess I can all happen. I, so I had two, two moments that are very different, but I'll say them fast. Um, the first was when I was an assistant, I was coming up and I was sort of trying to break into writing. I started on 90210 and I did a year, the showrunner left, the new showrunners came in and said, um, please stay, it's our first time doing this. It would be helpful to have an experienced assistant. And then I got a call from this woman who said, hey, my name is Liz Merriweather. I just sold a show to Fox. We're calling it New Girl. Um, I've heard you're a great assistant. Will you come on board to this? Like this show I just sold, I think it's gonna go. And I met with her and she was amazing. And it was like this big exciting new thing. But then I know what you know, was like, we'll pay you a lot of money for an assistant. You'll just hang, you know, the guy was sort of like, ah. Um, and uh, a, a mentor said to me, um, he said, new girls pulling writers from 30 Rock. They're pulling like absolute stars. They are never gonna give you a script as an assistant. They're never gonna promote you. They're never gonna, he was like, it's a big sexy job. And it's so tempting early in your career to take a sexy job. He said, what you need to do is find out if 90210 will promote you, if they'll give you scripts, if they'll help you on your journey to be a writer, because that's, your goal should be to have like the sexiest job on the, on the resume. It should be to have the career path that you're trying to carve for yourself. And so I went back to the showrunners and I said, look, I really want to be a writer. If I stick with you, do you promise you'll help me? And do you promise you'll do everything you can to put me on the track to writing? And they said, yes. And fortunately, they're honorable women who um, did work really hard to mentor me and, uh, and then gave me my first script on television and my first job as a, as a writer. Um, but I, that is something that I just, that general moments for me, like uh, sexy jobs have come along that are really tempting because like, you know, you're like, oh, everyone's heard of this show. I can, if I put it on Facebook, my mom will know what it is. Um, but I always try to ignore the, like the, the you know, the appeal of a, of a big name thing. Um, and, and take the job that feels right for where I am in my life and my career. Um, and then, sorry, really fast. The second moment I'll say is a couple of years ago, I was approached by um, uh, a Latin ex's TV stars production company with a property that they wanted me to adapt. And I was on the fence because it was sort of like a Latino family drama. And, um, and I said to my, my reps at the time, um, I don't know if I should write this. I don't know. Like I, I have a, like a foster son that is, Mexican American who I helped raise. So I have like slightly more connection to this community than your average white lady, but I'm not Latina and I, it's not my experience. And he said, well, the other two writers they're meeting with are white men, middle-aged white men. And so I took the job and sort of told myself, um, well, if this goes, I'll be the only white person on staff. I'll have a room that's I'm, where I'm the only, I'll, I'll try to have a crew where I'm the only white person. I'll, and I sort of told myself all these things um, to make it feel okay. And to date, it was the hardest pilot I've ever had to write. It took me the longest. It, uh, there was a sense of wrongness about it from the beginning of this isn't my story to tell and I shouldn't have said yes to this. And even if at the time I thought I was the better, um, the better option than the other people they were considering, like it wasn't my job to save the project. It was my job to like sort of um, decide if this was a story that I had the right to, um, to explore. And I don't think I did. And so in terms of moments that I regret in my career, that that's a big one where I feel like um, I, you know, I should have said to them, you need to find a Latinx writer for this. And if they didn't, it wouldn't have been my fault. But um, so yeah, trying to sort of step into an area that wasn't mine, uh, wasn't, wasn't my story to tell is my big regret moment in my career. I think that's really powerful that you're sharing that because I think all of these questions I think are determined to, to help our viewers really empower themselves in those in those moments where they have to make those decisions. And uh, each one of your guys' experiences, deeply personal as they may be, will really, I think, help uh, all of our great viewers that we have here today. Um, I have a, I have a um, moment that I can share. Um, it was when I had did uh, worked on Revenge and my option wasn't renewed. And so, um, I got a call from my good friend and mentor, Wendy Calhoun, and I was sharing with her about my experience about, you know, why I wasn't going back to the show. And she says, oh, she's like, well, um, I just got staffed on this new show called Empire, working with Lee Daniels and Danny Strong. And, you know, with um, that, I know that they're looking for people. And so I got super excited, like, oh my God, okay, cool. Cause you know, I can go from being staffed on this show to being staffed on this show. And she's like, oh no, no, no. 
we're already fully staffed, but I think they're going to be looking for, um, uh, you know, people production, you know, to, to work in, in, in the writer's room, writer's assistant, script coordinator. And she, and I remember, you know, having a moment because I think, you know, my ego and pride had gotten in the way. I was just like, oh, this is going to be so embarrassing if I tell my friends that, you know, I was just staffed on this, you know, huge show. And now I'm taking a step back to go work on, you know, you know, this, this series, but I'm not a writer. How embarrassing. Um, but she, thank God, you know, she talked to me, she said, I know there's so many writers in your position who get staffed, get their first staff job, and then something happens, whether the show doesn't continue or, you know, their option doesn't get picked up and you have to take a step back. But I promise you, she said, I promise you, I, I think you're, you're not going to regret this. And um, I had my interview and, you know, I talked to the showrunner and um, the one thing that she promised me was that she was very open to was, of course, we would like you in the room. Uh, you just came from a show. Of course, we would like you in the room. So I, I didn't want to sit out that season without being exposed, being around other writers, being in a writer's room. All, and it was the best decision of my life. I have no regrets because, you know, um, of where we are now. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I will say um, there, may, there are peaks and valleys in this business. Yes. <laughs> As we all know, I'm sure. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, Gladys? Oh yeah, so mine was like um, a little bit like Liz's first um, experience where I was on a show and I had been a script coordinator for a really long time on the show. And, um, you know, I think they just saw me as like a script coordinator, not as a writer. And I had to have, and I had been offered um, another job as a script coordinator on another show. Uh, and then I, I was like, you know what? Like, I, I, I can't keep doing this to myself. Like I actually have to, I have to ask for either a script or I have to make my showrunner aware that I'm a writer. Um, so I sat down with, and the, the other show that was offering me a job, they were offering me a script as well. Um, and so, you know, it's a little bit more enticing and the job that I had been at for, a couple of years already, they weren't offering me anything yet. Um, and he had already said like there was people in line for, for freelances, but I sat down with him and I had to take that chance and say like, hey, like I really want to write, you know, like that's that's my goal. It's like, I want to write and I would love to, you know, get an opportunity to write for this show and get a freelance or whatever. And I, I have this other job offer, but I really love this show and I want to stay. And that took, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of like, a, I don't really like confrontation and I don't, you know, like to, to ask for things, but I think the, that moment is like something came over me and I was like, I just have to do it. I just have to ask, you know what I mean? And I think people, especially like younger assistants, um, they don't ask for stuff and no one's going to read your mind, you know what I mean? And so that moment I asked for uh, a freelance episode. I'm like, look, I would love, I've been here a couple of years. Um, would you please consider me for a freelance? And he, you know, was like, well, I didn't know you wanted to write. And I'm like, what? <laughs> like, how did you not know? But, um, you know, I think from then on, like my career took a completely different trajectory and I started getting, he did give me a freelance and then I got staffed on the show a year later, uh, a couple of years later. But from then on, I just started, um, I started envisioning myself as a writer and not just like support staff. Um, and so that decision that I made was like the best decision. And it was so nerve wracking. I just, I still kind of am like nervous talking about it because I just remember the feeling of going into my boss's office and asking for this. But I feel like it totally changed my life and it was the best decision I ever made, so. That's awesome. Thank you so much for sharing that. We've got a couple questions from uh, our viewers. Uh, I'm going to start with Diana. Can you guys explain what the traditional path is to getting you to your levels? Where do you start and how do you progress through the ranks? Traditional. Oh, go ahead. Oh, yeah, go ahead. I, I, I was just saying traditional is an interesting word because, you know, there's so many different avenues. So many um, different ways to jump in soon. I, I, if we're going the traditional route, I would say maybe starting as a writer's PA um and then working your way up but for me my experience was i started as a writer's assistant on revenge um the second season i got my first freelance script and the third season i was staffed that's more of a traditional route I, i'm seeing now though that I, I don't know it seems like there's so many different avenues to get into a writer's room 
I mean, you can write a blog. You can you can be funny on Twitter. You know what I mean? Like there's right. so many different and then ways. all of a sudden have a development deal. It's amazing. You know? so, <laughs> I, just, I think that's true for certain people. I yeah. don't know if it's true for everybody. Yeah. Um, but listen, I always wanted to be a, a writer's assistant. And that job was like a unicorn. Like I could never find it. I just was like, I don't know how, where they exist, but please come fly to me, but it never did. <laughs> and so um, I went the route of uh, workshops. So I got into the Warner Brothers Writers Workshop, one of the fellowships. Um, there's a ton, Disney has one. I think Fox used to have one. Um, CBS has one. So that was the route. And then from there you get to be a staff writer, which is the most junior, level writer on staff and then you move up there's different there's oh my god so many different titles yeah, um, but with each title there's like lower level you go to a mid-level position and then uh upper level which is from supervising producer on and all that means is more work <laughs> so <laughs> like, more money. <laughs> yeah more yeah more money but yeah more work so if you're an upper level writer you you're more involved with the longevity of the series so after all the other writers have rolled off and are you know going off to other shows you're there with the showrunner um and helping them finish the job and yeah, I just also, like oh. as i just just to set that out for those of you who don't know what a writer's assistant is it's not actually you're not like a personal assistant to a writer it's um it's sort of like being a court reporter so we work we all work in a writer's room um so we sit around a table there's whatever six to ten people probably and we just talk it out. Like, I don't bring my phone in the room. I don't bring my computer in the room. I sit there for nine hours a day and I'm like, hey, what if we do this? What if we do that? And we just like talk nonstop. Um, and then there's a writer's assistant who sits at the table if you're in a nice room or like in some f far away corner if you're in a less uh, nice room. And they just basically court report. They write down every single thing that every single person says and it's their job. So like when I was a writer's assistant or Kevin Williamson who was very prolific, I would have like 35 pages of notes at the end of the day and the writers would go home and it would take me three to four more hours to go through the 35 pages of notes and organize them into a structure. And the goal is sort of to um, make a living document that anyone could read to remind themselves of what we did in the room that day, or if they were out of the room, if they were on set, if they were in casting, if they, whatever, they could read the notes from the night before and see what we, we went over. So that's, um, Latoya was talking about how that's like a very coveted position and it's, it's sort of because, um, it's, it's, a, it's, it felt like going to grad school. I mean, I haven't been to grad school, but that's what I imagine grad school felt like. It just, every single day you get sort of hammered into you what story is and, and the rhythms of story and the structure. And, um, and then very often there's a, there's some writer's guild incentives. Our union um, is always trying to make space for new voices. And one of the things they do is what you've been, you've heard people say freelance episodes. So there's a penalty for shows that don't hand out a freelance, two freelance episodes a year. Um, and they have to pay, the show has to pay the writer's guild if they keep all their scripts in house. So most shows will give out one or two scripts to people who aren't uh, technically on staff. And those often go to the writer's assistant or the script coordinator who is um, another sort of uh, support position in the writer's office. Um, anyway, sorry, that's a very technical explanation of. Uh, I wanted, um, Amanda, I wanted to say someone on the comments said that they were, you know, older and like, you know, like older, 38's not old, um, but like, you know, at the age where you're like, you know, like where you're like, I can't take one of these, you know, assistant positions because, you know, they're trying to pay, we're trying to get assistants paid more money and some, some places are succeeding. Um, but so for me, like, that's the reason I also like Latoya went through the Warner Brothers workshop and that's how I got started um, because I had, at the time I was an a personal assistant, but I made a lot, of, I made a lot of money and I didn't work very hard. And so for me, I was like, I can't, I can't give that up. Um, and so I was fortunate to get into the fellowships. And I think like, you know, it's not the only way and it's, it is very competitive, but I always say to people like, you should be applying to them all because like, I know people who get in every single year to every single program. And I know people who've entered for three or four years in a row and finally get in and get staffed. And so like, it's definitely, it's not, it's not an easy way, but also getting the writer's assistant or getting the, you know, um, writer's PA jobs aren't easy either. Um, and I do think the writers like, in those programs, you have to write, you know, either a, they're kind of changing, but you have to write a spec script of an existing show for some of them, like Warner Brothers still uh, requires that. And then you have to write an original pilot. And so it does require you to be writing new material every single year. And the writers that I've seen, that I've known, and I work with a lot of lower level writers or aspiring writers, 
those writers who have like been entering the workshops and like writing new spec scripts and writing new pilots, their work is so good. And I feel like when they do get these opportunities and they do get staffed, I've seen them really succeed because they have been writing so much. And so I think that's like, it's like, even if you're not gonna get in that first year, like enter, like you might get in the second year, you might, I mean, I know a writer who like entered last year and like had never entered before and got in. And I know another writer who it was his fourth or fifth year who got in this year. So I think that is a, it is a really um, a, a good opportunity, especially if you're in a second career and can't can't realistically take these assistant positions. Right. Now, whatever, have, sorry. Oh, go ahead. I just wanted to add real quick. Um, what everybody said is 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 real. Like that's. I started off also as a, um, it was like the first year of the NBC Writers on the Verge program. And that really helped that helped me get an agent. Um, and also like the blacklist is also a good resource for people to like um, send your scripts in and have them read by professionals. That's, um, a, web, that's a website, right? Yes, it's a website. Um, and, you know, also just, I think Twitter is becoming like a way to network with um, working writers and to get your stuff read. Um, was it Latoya that did you do that uh, hashtag? Yeah. Can you, can you yeah, tell? I uh, started this hashtag called uh, hashtag WGA staffing boost. Mm -hmm. And it was really um, born out of this conflict that we're having with the agents. And so uh, every year during a certain time of year, like April, May, that's our staffing season where people are looking for, looking to hire writers, um, all, all the staff too, like the, your writer's PA, your writer's assistants. Um, but the idea was that if agents weren't sending their clients out, that Twitter could be a place where they could look for available writers who have this badass, amazing material, and they just needed to be able to get it into the right hands. And so people would respond to the hashtag and say, hey, uh, they would pitch themselves and say, hey, I'm this writer, I write comedy. Um, I have a half hour uh, script that's about this. Um, this is why I would be an asset in the room. And so showrunners would be able to go and look at the hashtag and hire people. So. A, a few people have gotten hired from that. So Julie Pleck hired someone for her show through the hashtag. Um, writers like, um, oh my God. We did on Vita, I think Tanya. Yeah, Vita, Tanya, yeah. Tanya uh, staffed someone from the hashtag. Um, uh, yeah, so a bunch of people have been able to use it as a really great resource in order to find writers, to find writers assistants, to find PAs. Um, so it's been a really cool uh, way social media has been able to break through the to the, the castle wall. Yeah. Uh, I've got a question from YouTube. Uh, as For you as female creators, what are your thoughts on the fact that even women who are supposedly written as being average are portrayed by attractive females on television? Girls and women who are average looking or, not, or even a bit unattractive are never represented. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's like a lack of imagination, really. Um, that's what it boils down to. Um, people not being willing to look outside this tiny little box of what they think someone should look like. Um, it's just laziness. <laughs> Sorry, but, that's like my also, unvarnished opinion. <laughs> I think, just because I had to talk about this a lot for this, that LA Times thing I did, I think it's also, um, it really depends where you are. Because I, I think what people don't realize is there's so many layers of approvals for casting. Um, so like some networks, for example, put... Um, a lot of emphasis on how good looking all the people are. I won't say what letters their <laughs> network has in the name. Um, I think we know, I think we know. But I think that you guys, you know, like there are certain networks where like the mandate is like, people love our network because we have pretty people. Um, and so I can do everything in my power to cast someone who looks more like me than like Cindy Crawford and it's not gonna matter because they'll never get past um, studio casting and network casting. So like when we bring people in, it's it literally, it goes through casting director first. So we don't even see 80% of the tapes because the casting director cuts out 80% of the people and gives us the best, the top 20%. And so the casting director's taste matters and then our taste matters and then the it goes to studio and then it goes to network. So there's all these layers of approval. I will say, um, I think it's getting better. Mm -hmm. I think um, like when I was at MTV, uh, we had to fight to cast this guy because he was too hot. And their thing was like, we really, we don't want to be a network that only is pretty like shiny people. We want, we want people who seem real. And so that was super cool that they, um, 
that they were open. They were like, we were like, but this guy's the best one. They're like, but he's too hot. He belongs on like a hot person network. And we were like, we'll try to make him uglier. We, but you know, it was, it was one time in my life I fought in reverse um, for that. But I think, you know, I think if you watch a lot of cable networks and a lot of um, sort of elevated content, and by that, I mean things that are not on broadcast. Don't fire me, CBS. Um, <laughs> You know, I, th I think it's getting better personally. And I, but I think it's, um, it can be hard because there's, you're trying to fight for so many things when you're casting as a writer, you're trying to, to fight for racial diversity. I personally, um, I have a very close family member who's disabled. So I just fought to have a disabled actor, physically disabled actor in one of my episodes. I was on Switched at Birth where we had half our cast, cast was hard of hearing or death. Um, and that was a big fight for many other reasons. And so I think like, there's so many different fights going on when it comes to casting and sometimes you can pick like, but I just want them to look normal. And sometimes it has to be, but diversity of ethnicity is really important to me. And I, um, you know, I hope every network president is watching this and feeling like they want to change, but. Um, but I also feel like there's like a difference between the way women are treated in that sense and yeah. the way men are treated because you can have a yeah. show where Steve Buscemi could be the lead of the show and that's fine. Or like William yeah. H. Macy, I worked on Shameless, like something like that. And then you could not have that for a woman I, okay. at least I haven't seen it I don't know um but I do think that it is getting better but it, it will always be a fight so I worked um on Into the Badlands and we shot in um Ireland and so one of our mandates for the show is in the future even if it's dystopian there will be people of color there will be black people in these shots and so <laughs> that was a big challenge because we're okay. shooting internationally and we had to fly people in from London and from the states but it was it came from the showrunner. It came from us advocating, saying, yeah. "This is what we want. This is what we need to see." And it's always going to be a fight. They're never going to just do the right thing just because. So we just you, if you want to be in this business, just know that that's part of it. And those fights will be small. Some of them will, will be big. Some of them you might lose, but you're going to have to fight. I, it's so interesting too when you talk about like casting and stuff. I remember I had a I'd written an episode um, and. I was a waitress, right? Like, and the casting directors called me and they're like, and it was supposed to be a diverse character. I mean, it was like, you know, it was a co-star. It was a very small role. And they were like, you know, we're just having trouble finding someone. <laughs> I'm like, wait, you're telling me we live in Los Angeles where half the pop, like is actors who are, and you can't, and they were, I was like, no, like go and find someone else. Like, it, it was just so crazy to me that like, that it is, it is a lot of it too, though, can just be laziness. Like we have yeah. our list of like tw 10 people we bring in and we really like these people and they might be good actors, but we just don't want to look harder. And so, you know, when you find those great casting directors who are willing to like, open their lists and bring in new people. And um, that's really when the change happens too, because they're they're just as much the gatekeepers as a studio and the network. Yeah, I was just about to say, it's really important to make sure that your casting director, you, your casting director's interests are aligned with yours. If you're passionate about diversity across the spectrum on your show, it's important to get a casting director who's right there with you to fight the good fight when you take it to up to the studio on the network. Yeah. yeah. But I guess as creators, it's also our responsibility to be intentional of who we are writing, yeah. uh, who our characters, what characters we're writing. Um, like for instance, right now I'm writing a pilot and it's about a woman who looks kind of like me, you know, and it's just like, I don't want like the tradition, like if when this goes to, you know, the network or whatever, I don't want it to look like, you know, like a Salma Hayek or something, you know, I'm just like, I want her to look real. And I think um, we, we, it starts from us, you know, and I think we do have to fight the fight when it gets to that point. Yeah. But I think it's, um, it's, it starts here. So we just have to be intentional of like, I want this person to look as real as possible. Or like Liz said, she had a, 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 a fat um, character in her show or whatever. So that's, you know, we just have to be like intentional when we're writing these characters. Absolutely. You know, one of the things that I've been hearing um, is hard in, during this crazy time, um, either if you're a writer's PA or, or, or a writer's assistant, um, and there's a virtual writer's room, like, first of all, how do you, how do you stand out in this type of scenario, or even when you're in a room on a show, like how, how do you balance the level of appropriateness and also speaking out so your voice and your intention is heard. Um, 
I feel like I keep talking, but I'm sorry. This, I stand out because I talk too much. Um, but I will say, I think it's a really different question depending on who you are. And like, um, uh, I think depending on your age and race and gender, you it's standing out is a little easier, or a little um, tougher. And I will say like, I, um, I think sometimes in, in rooms you have to pick, if you can find a really great ally, like, um, I, on my current show, there's like a straight white guy in the room who is such a good ally. And there's some things that they come from him. They just, they get heard better. Um, I mean, my dynasty is amazing. This is not, it, it, nothing ever happens in the show. It's, it's a great, great inclusive room, but um, you know, and I think, uh, so sometimes it's like, like I was on a show where the showrunner wanted to do um, a big arc about a, a black community and we had all white writers in the room. Um, and the showrunner's solution was, I'll find a black person, then it'll be okay. Um, and we, we've, then a black writer was hired and that person um, felt like if they spoke up all of the time about um, representation or things that were offensive or um, problematic, that they be she became the angry black woman. And she felt really, really torn in our room of like, I need to speak up because some of the things that are being said are like hateful, but I also, the more <laughs> I do, the less of a voice I have because people are like, oh God, she's speaking up again. Mm -hmm. And I said, like, text me, I will be the annoying voice. And then when you speak up, it'll still have power because you're not, it, it's not every single minute. I'll be the, I don't care. I'll be the annoying one. Like, I'm happy to be like, eh, 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 you know, because I quite frankly have a little more power um, as a privileged white person. And so like, I've also found that with men where I say like, hey, this is super sexist. Our boss is not gonna hear it from me. But if I say it to you, can you can you say it as a man and he'll listen to you? Um, and those allies are really important. So um, I don't know, I don't really have a conclusion to this except for <laughs> it's great if you have a voice and I try to be really cognizant if I can be the voice for someone else or if I don't have a voice of finding um, an ally who's more palatable to the, the network or the showrunner or whatever the problem may be to sort of help um, elevate my voice or amplify my voice because um it is really hard there's a as women uh, uh you know and just as as not straight white men i think it can just be really really difficult to um things that we say don't always get taken in the same context and so you have to play this dance of like i'm a good hang i'm like a cool girl that likes whiskey um but i'm also a feminist sorry you know it's a fun it's, it's, no, sorry. Like, it's a fine line that you have to walk especially if you are the only black writer in the room. Um, I've encountered this many times because usually because I write genre shows, I'm usually the only woman and usually the only black person. And so there are just times when you have to pick the battle and you get better at it the more experience you get. But there's just times where I'm like, hey, we only have one black lead on the show. Maybe let's not kill them. Maybe let's not murder them, you know? And so these are the conversations that you have to have and you just have to be comfortable with everyone looking at you like, oh my God, again, you're bringing this up. But yes, I'm going to bring it up every single time until you listen or you don't. And then you see what happens when you don't, you know? So uh, you just have to make a decision that there's gonna be things that you're gonna fight for um, no matter what. I also think like if you, if you like, and this goes to like how you can be useful or important in the writer's room, especially when you're starting out, because there's some people who are as like vocal and verbal, whether they're a staff writer or co-EP. And then there's some people like, it took me a long time to, in a room to find my voice because I was so used to like waiting till I was asked to, you know, be, to, you know, for people to ask me to speak. And like, I was like, so I think if you're, if you're like that and it's going to take you a little bit of time to get comfortable, especially when it's a new job, then like be that person who has a special skill. Are you the person that's like super great at research and you're going to come into the writer's room every day and you're going to know so much more than everybody else about that pit, that like random thing your showrunner mentioned the day before, um, or be the person that volunteers to do stuff that nobody else wants to do. Like I'll write sides for this scene that the, the casting needs, or I'll write, you know, I'll go write the synopsis or I did marketing materials for a show once just, and like got flowers sent from the star because I volunteered to do something like it's those kinds of, and then it looks good to the, the showrunners like, Oh wait, come in early, stay late, you know, all of those things. I mean, not in a Zoom room, obviously, but like, you know, all of those things like, um, really like can really make you stand out and sort of give you the time to find and develop your voice because some people just are not, I mean, we're all writers, 
but like so much of this job is about being like a public speaker who can also convey their thoughts to her, to her, to everyone else. So I think that's really important when you're starting out. Yeah, I will also say like off of that too, like I, in, for my own personal experience, like as a human, I am someone who gets like very quiet and very shy in big groups. And so like, and like being in a writer's room, you're in a big group all the time. And so like, for me, it was like that coupled with also like real imposter syndrome, like in a major way made me like very self-conscious. And so like, for me, I feel like similar to what Holly's saying is like, it really is about like, for me, I had to just like kind of in some ways fake it till you make it a little bit in terms of confidence and just like acting like you belong there, even if you don't believe it. Um, like in like for me, this is a dumb small thing, but like something I, I felt like a fraud every day for like my first 20 weeks. Um, Cause you're like, when I was initially hired, it was on like a 20 week um, contract. And I like made the, it's changed now so I can say it, but I made like the password on my computer that I had to like log in on every day, not a fraud so that I would like be forced to type it every day um, multiple times and just like be like kind and gentle to yourself but also like force yourself to step out of your comfort zone until it's, it's your comfort zone. Yeah, I was just gonna say it's like it's a it's a muscle that you exercise. I just I remember the first season that I was writing on Empire. She had already been staffed on Revenge, but we were writing together, and I was just feeling like, am I saying enough? Like, you know, do I deserve to be here? And I remember looking to one of my coworkers, Eric Haywood, and he is somebody who has he he would he would not say a lot in the room but when he spoke it landed and to and that is to me that's just an example of like what you can do you may not like be the person that's like just you know talking 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 giving all these stories all the time but if you if every time you speak is something that is like powerful and it's like oh it's going up on a board oh yeah this is a pitch that can fix the problems that we're having like that's also very useful too you don't have to like be the person that's just running your mouth the whole time or feel that you have to run your mouth in order to feel like you know valuable or validated you know in the work that you do so yeah yeah, yeah, can't vouch. Talking too much does not help. <laughs> <laughs> it's not the right way to go. Don't be, do not follow me. Like for me, I, I guess I just like from the get go, someone gave me this piece of advice. Um, is I think Holly kind of um, talked a little bit about it. It's have a skill. Um, and like for me, I, I feel like research was my thing. Like I learned everything for every show that I've been on. Like I would like delve into that subject matter like a crazy person um and I would be all about it this would be my not my life but it would you know consume me and I think the showrunners really um valued that in the room they would always ask me like oh so you know a lot about this like and I sometimes didn't I was like new to this you know like I also worked on Dynasty and I didn't know about rich white people but I I, I faked it till I made it made it <laughs> but, uh, but it you know it's it's I think that's one thing is like find a skill that you can bring to the room, um, and uh, like for younger writers that I'm that I work with, I always tell them that too is like look like you may not be like the joke person or you may not be the story person, but find what you're really good at and put 150 percent of yourself in that because that's what you're gonna that's how you're gonna stand out is like if someone's really good at story and they're like a staff writer or whatever like just be, be that person, be the, the person that can fix holes, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, and come come prepared, I think. Someone that is there like a little early and like is prepared, has read the notes, like that is a way to stand out is if you're just a really like, you have really good work ethic because I mean, a lot of people are just busy. A lot of us writers have like kids like me <laughs> and we have like a lot of shit going on. But if you're like the prepared writer who's always on point um you know there's a good balance between talking a lot and not talking a lot um and you have funny anecdotes I think that's the way to stand out and be really successful so off of that too just one like teeny tiny thing I want to add on to that I'm remembering now also like obsess like if I ever said anything that like didn't land um or let, like a pitch that like people didn't buy or like anything in the room that I then like 
thought wasn't good would when I was first starting like would very much obsess over it and feel like I was very bad at this and it was proof that and that everyone was thinking about how bad I am at this and someone once told me like trust me like nobody's thinking about the thing that you just said for like longer than it took you to say it so like nobody's thinking about it everyone has a million other things going on like let it go and move on um and I think that's an important thing to remember too Absolutely. Um, Tina is asking all of us uh, to, to describe what the writer's room looks like right now. Uh, every, every writer's room I've been in looks different. So like on Viva, the second season, we had couches. We, we did not have a writer's room table. Um, we just sat in couches and it was like a very casual family type atmosphere. Um, but then on like other shows, there's like a writer's room. There's a bunch of like toys in the middle of the table and like junk food and markers there's whiteboards all around the room um but yeah it just depends on each writer's room i think it's different i was gonna they're say all that, they all look like this this is what they look like right now <laughs> yeah it's a lot of brady bunch boxes uh in the writer's room right now so right <laughs> uh, zoom is a whole different animal um right. it's not that different it's just a little harder to gauge when you're pitching an idea or you can't really sense if people are like feeling it it's like Hey man, did that joke land or is that story point, you know, doing what it needs to do to push the story forward? Mm -hmm. um, so it's it's hard, but uh, it's better than not being able to be in a room right now. Right, right, right. Yeah, our boss just, we're, we're, we start back in two weeks and he said basically like, I doubt we can go nine, nine hours a day. Like we're going to see what happens, but it's it's a lot more tiring, more tiring. Being it is, it truly screen. is very tiring. Yeah, so I think we'll probably do, my guess is we'll do like, two hours in the morning, have a very long lunch break where we all think about things two hours in the afternoon and then have homework as opposed to normally you're just like power through, you often eat lunch at the table and just keep going. And then when you leave, you get to stop thinking about it. I think now, at least for, for Dynasty, um, my guess is that we'll probably be in Zoom much less time than we would normally be in the room, but have a lot more homework to do outside of Zoom. Yeah. Right. Um, what if, Kristen Clifford just asked a question that I think is helpful to everyone on the on the call. Um, she said, I'm, I'm currently working on a film project with a production company, but my main focus is TV. I'd love to get into the movie of the week space. I think that's M-O-T-W, uh, but also would like to be staffed on a show. Is all of this too disparate? Um, and I think I can just say, you know, that I think it's probably a good idea if you work in TV, just have TV samples. Um, as an executive, when I'm staffing a show, um, you know, unless it's like a specific comedy that I'm just looking for like a joke person and I can read like a play that's funny and then I can say, oh, that person could be staffed on a show. Um, I think the, the more scripts that you have that fit that mold of the show that I'm staffing for um, is, the, is gonna get the win. But I think, uh, so um, to answer that though, like if you wanted to do like, like my sister works for the Hallmark Channel as an executive and like um, she has a lot of writers who work on series and they write movies when they're on hiatus and stuff. So I do think that if that's something, like if that's what you were talking about and you wanted to do something like that, it is great because they're, you know, the writers that I know, like it's like they're never not working because they, they always have like a movie due and then they have a series. So it is possible, but I do think targeting your, your you know, ideas and your samples to what you really want to do is important. I wrote two Hallmark movies last year while on staff. It just, it also just spent some time management. I don't have a life or any friends, but I wrote two Hallmark movies while <laughs> full time at a show. So you can definitely do both. Yes. Um, Bree Seamster asks, what advice do you have for writers that are going on generals, do's and don'ts, talking points and Zoom etiquette? <laughs> Wear pants. <laughs> My I, like my advice always, if you're having any type of uh, meeting, is to be yourself. And just if you're like a super nerdy geek out person, like I am, just geek out. You know, um, if you're, you know, don't be quiet. You know, <laughs> you know, just try to uh, go with the flow of the conversation is also a thing that I like to tell people. You know, because sometimes you're so anxious to get your points in. You're like, oh my God, I have to tell them why I'm so perfect for this show that you don't let the conversation breathe, um, that you won't go off on a little tangent to talk about, you know, someone in their sourdough baking or whatever, <laughs> you know, uh, you got to be able to go with the flow of the conversation, veer it back to where you want to go. And it's a skill you get better at the more that you do. 
But honestly, the biggest thing you can do is be enthusiastic, be yourself, know who you're talking to, you know, have done your research on who they are, um, and just be excited to be there. Absolutely. Um, uh, also, if anyone has any other questions, I'm, I'm reading the chat, so so throw them right on in there. Um, uh, I might ask this. Uh, I don't know what the answers will be, but when offered a partner, when offered to partner with a male producer, agent, or manager, what are the best ways to navigate that partnership, seeing that they come from a different point of view? So when I this when I met with Dynasty this year, um, Josh Reams is the new showrunner, and I was like really frank in my meeting with him. I said um, I don't do that well with straight white men, and he said that's okay, me neither. And he's a straight white guy. Um, but I just like established up front, like, this is sort of my vibe. I'm like an angry woman. And, um, and he was like, that's cool. He's like, I get it. Me too. He's like, I'm, and like, he's the best. He's, no, I've had a, a lot of amazing boss. He's a great boss. I love working for him. Um, so I think at this point in my career, I, at least I'm lucky enough to be able to like be really upfront about like, this is the sort of angry female vibe I give off. Um, and if men seem cool with it, then I'm like, okay, great. We're going to work well together. Um, but yeah, there are a lot of producers in my early career. Like I was casting a pilot once and um, and there's this girl who was so good. She was playing like, she was playing like a 15 year old. It was, like, it was a YA pilot. And um, the producer was like, look, I'm going to say what everyone's thinking. I wouldn't sleep with her. And I was like, ah, I hope you wouldn't sleep with her. Sorry, that's quite loud. But like, she's supposed to be like a 15 year old. Like it's not, um, but it spooked the network and then they didn't cast her because they were so afraid that like men wouldn't find her I don't know what kind of language I can use when a public library sleepable withness right. high enough. Um, and so like I avoid men like that now at all costs, even if the project seems super, super exciting. If I like get that vibe from a male producer, I'm peace out. Yeah, I had a I had a meeting once on a pilot where they were looking for, you know, a, 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 a man. Uh, it turned out to be they were only looking for men, but to supervise me. Um, and I remember having this meeting and um, they like I had the meeting and then they like fired all the executives and my pilot died but I remember like having this meeting and I called my husband from the car and I was like if that guy supervises me I don't want my own show um because a I was like he'll steal it from me I can already tell from that but also just like nothing that he said made me think he cared at all about my vision and like what I wanted like what I wanted to do I wasn't even sure he'd read the script but he made it very clear how lucky I was that he had taken the meeting and so I think you know that's just really frustrating but I, on the other on the other hand like I've never had I've had one female showrunner I've ever worked for and I've never had a female mentor or a female like ally upper level like that's kind of like shepherded me it's always been men who have like you know, hired me and, 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 you know, supported me and written recommendations for me. I've had women actually say no when I've asked them to write me recommendations. So I think, I think now that I'm like moving into upper level, like I've, I've found I have more female allies because we've all kind of grown up together. Um, but I think like when I was starting, like it was, it was all just like, thank God these guys gave me a shot because like a lot of the women just weren't. Um, I have a couple, a lot of good questions just came in. So uh, Tara said, speaking of generals, how much are you ladies thinking about scripts you have or want to develop and bringing those up in meetings versus just getting to know the executive and speaking about who you are? You should always do that. You should um, have like a couple of, you know, pocket pitches of, you know, just a log line or something that you're thinking about because there's always going to come a point in the meeting where they say, so what are you working on? so you know you want to have an answer so so even if it's not something that you completely have finished or that you're still working on it's a work in in progress you know just bring it up if it's something that you think would be a good fit for that company i definitely would i've done i've done the thing where i'm like i pitch like all of the pocket pitches and you like know that none of them and then you're like but i've also been working like thinking about like and like even like a more general thing and they're like oh tell us more and so like it is like even if there's like some like like podcast you've read or a true story or IP or something like have as many of those. Cause like all the ideas that you thought were like, these are my like three best, they may not like, but I do think it helps um, in a meeting. And sometimes they won't, none of them will land, but like, at least they know that you're like that writer who's got like lots of ideas. Right. Yeah. For me, like when I do generals, like, yeah, you do start talking about like who you are, where you came from, all that stuff. And then, um, you have have them tell you about the company and then see what pitches of yours um make sense to pitch 
Uh, I've actually almost sold one that I, this was a while back, but it was just one like idea that I had just thought of, like not even, I hadn't been fully flushed out. And I had uh, pitched this to the company, to the person I was meeting with and they loved it. And like, I was like, well, you know, I'm still working on it. And like, she was like, but you know, we just, we really want to buy this. Like I want, I almost sold it in the room. There was some politics involved that it didn't happen, but you do always want to be prepared to, to come in with that. Um, don't overdo it, but I think, you know, just whatever makes sense for this, for the meeting, whoever you're meeting with, if you have a, a project that you think might, they might like, then by all means, you should, you should definitely do it. Um, great. I have another one. Uh, when you're st by Ariel, uh, when you're staffed, how are you spending your evenings and mornings in preparation for going back into the room? Uh, for us, Ariel, we're literally writing all day. Uh, <laughs> that's how we're preparing. Um, no, how we really need to be preparing is uh, going back to sleep at a decent time. Um, no, but I think that like one of the things that I was telling um, Sheikah is really kind of prioritizing balance because I think because of the weird time that we're in, um, you either shut down completely creatively or you are you you don't have any distinction between um, this is my time and this is work time, which is also not really good. You know what I mean? So I think for us, it really is just kind of trying to balance out our days, um, you know, putting a few hours into the things that we're working on currently, but then also making time to exercise getting up in the morning, you know, to read, pray, Bible study, whatever you, you know, whatever you do that's going to kind of ground you to be able to get some work done and let some type of creative flow happen in the midst of a pandemic. <laughs> um, that's what we just kind of do, just prioritizing balance and, and, and also prioritizing self-care. Um, you know, um, um, I think somebody mentioned um, earlier um, how it is important to kind of have grace and compassion towards yourself. Um, realizing that like the first thing that you write is not going to be like perfection like just hey ready to go you know what I mean like just kind of taking time and just kind of having some grace and compassion you know with you know the writing and just know that you know it writing is rewriting writing is rewriting you know and and the reality is we are um everybody in the world right now is kind of experiencing some sort of trauma because this is a weird different time right you know so just for for us as creatives is <laughs> you know we're very sensitive um I think it is it's even more difficult to kind of do the thing that we love to do so yeah and I think of the more just a to in a non-pandemic sense what Holly was saying earlier sort of so there's all these different levels, right? And every year you bump up a level in the writer, the writing staff. And um, I think depending on what level you are, you might prepare differently at night when you leave work. Um, like if you're a staff writer who probably won't have as many opportunities to speak in the room because it's your first year. Um, you know, my, my first boss told me, as a staff writer, it's not your job to question anything, it's your job to support. And so if I say, let's kill off Kevin Bacon, you know that's the worst idea in the world because he's the star of the show. We're never going to kill off Kevin Bacon. Not your job to say that. It's your job to say, great murder, accident, uh, you know, suicide, rope, candlestick, knife, uh, you know, and staff writer, you should be supporting, you know, supporting those pitches. Um, and so when I was a staff writer and sort of starting out, I, um, I would spend more time sort of at night thinking how to solve the problems that had come up in the day that we hadn't quite worked out. So I could come in in the mornings with, with some solutions to things. Um, or if I felt like I had a day where I, where I hadn't pitched um, anything great, I would say, like, I'd be like, okay, when we move on tomorrow, I want to have three ideas for um, for character arcs that we could do in this episode for the for the B story, or you know. Um, but now, as an upper level writer who's often running the room, I um, tend to give like a hundred percent at work and then go home and hang out with my dog and my husband and not think as much about it. Um, unless there is a thing that, as a upper level writer, like Latoya was saying, you 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 have other different responsibilities. Like I'll have to watch cuts and give notes, or I'll have to um, watch casting, or I'll have to read someone's script and give feedback on it. And so it's sort of as an upper level writer, the things you do outside of work change. Um, but I think if the question is, is about when you're starting off, what can you do outside of work? I think it's, um, people are always grateful for solutions when, you, when you're stuck on a problem in the room and they're always grateful for fresh ideas. If you just, cause there'll be lulls in the room and then someone will be like, hey, I was thinking of this last night. Is this a cool thing we could do on the show? And people always love that cause it, it brings new energy and it brings sort of new life. 
Oh, I was just going to also say um, reading the notes because you'll see, you'll tend to find out that like as you move up, you probably read the notes less and less um, on a daily basis. Um, so if when you're lower level and you're reading the notes and you're able to just kind of recall like the things that the rest of the room has tend to, has forgotten for for whatever reason, it's just good to kind of have. Well, yesterday this is what we had. You know, we you guys have thought about this yesterday, so maybe that'll help. It is it's a good it's a good refresh. Um, one other thing that I um, find really helpful too is if anything is referenced in the room, like a movie or like a book or an article is referenced in the room that's like similar in tone or subject matter to like whatever you're talking about that day. If you haven't seen it or you haven't seen it in a long time or you haven't read it, like doing that after the room is over can be like a really active but not like super taxing way to to stay caught up on everything so you have the same everyone has the same working vocabulary um and is like a different way to sort of like be using your brain um that can still be relaxing but is still still actively preparing for the next day i think that's really a, a great a great note um, Jeff Locker asked the question, do you have any suggestions for connecting with showrunners with social media and promoting yourself as a writer without coming across as too forward or alter, ulterior motive V? Uh, also, this panel is so great and gives me hope. Thank you. Um, the one thing that I would just say is this really, this, this business is so relationship based. Um, I highly always recommend if you are in Los Angeles or New York, uh, there is an organization called JHRTS. Um, I highly recommend it just because I think it's a way for you to meet a lot of different people and kind of try to insert yourself in uh, those writers, you know, worlds or executives worlds and, and hopefully get close to potentially getting hired once you have that sample that you think is right for the, the show. But I'll toss it over to you guys. How do you feel about when, when people try to present their, their writing to you via social media? I mean, for uh, me, like, don't ever come to me and be like, here, read my script. <laughs> there has to be like, a, you know, something before that. Like, I've had people like slip into my DMs and be like, hey, like, I'm a big fan or whatever. I followed your career. And then it comes later. You know what I mean? Like, I, I don't like to like read people's scripts right away um, just because it's there's like liability issues, you know, and like a bunch of stuff. But I will say um, just follow that person. Like if you admire a showrunner or like a writer, just follow them on Twitter, interact with them like once in a while. And so they can kind of remember you and don't be like, there, there's a good balance, I guess, you know, don't be overly uh, creepy about it, but also like, yeah, get their attention or be like, hey, I watched your episode. I thought it was awesome. This was my favorite line. Um, just so that they can remember you. And then that's when you're like, I'm a writer. Like, I would love to pick your brain. Can I do it via email? Because we can't right now because it's, uh, <laughs> we're in a pandemic. But I think that's like the the way to go. But that's just me. I think too, like it's, um, I had a, writer, a, a girl who was like actually just out of college and she like wants to be a writer, but she was just looking, she had like an industry job, but she was looking to get, you know, a different, like to be more in the creative side. She was working at an agency. And she was like, I just, you know, I know the shows you've worked on. I just love to pick your brain. And, and I was like, okay. And like, she just kept emailing in like a very gracious kind of way, like checking in. And I'm like, I'm on deadline. I have a book due. I have an episode I'm filming in, you know, and like she did that. She would check in like, not like, I don't know, once a month for like eight months, 10 months. It wasn't intrusive. I mean, it was like very nice and very polite. And eventually I was like kind of impressed that like, and I like was like, sure, I'll meet you for a drink. And like, I helped her, like I passed her resume along to a friend and she ended up getting a job and like, you know, as an assistant, um, but like, you know, so I think it's like, it is that balance. Like some people could do that and could come across as really aggressive and annoying. And so it's like, and it's just about the person. I mean, I've definitely had people email me that I've been too busy to even get back to. So I think it's like, it's also timing on the writer you're reaching out to part. Like if, if you reached out to me and I'm not, I don't have deadlines and I don't have something going on you just got lucky, like, you know, but it's about finding that time and also taking the chance that like, maybe they won't even email you back, but at least you tried. Yeah. And I think the tone thing really matters. Like I get, because I leave my DMs open on Twitter um, because I try, I, I like to help people. If you, if you contact me and just, just sell yourself like, hey, and then, you know, I love this one line you wrote. Now here's a eight page dissertation about how great I am and why you should hire me. If I'm ever hiring or looking, it will be very abundantly clear. And so like, I don't, getting sort of unsolicited, um, just like 
sales pitches about why someone's so awesome don't I, like make me very annoyed. To be yeah. frank, um, a, a girl last month though hopped into my DM said, "Here are the shows you worked on that really meant something to me. Do you have twenty minutes to have on the phone where I could just pick your brain?" And I said, "You know what? I have twenty minutes. I always have twenty minutes. Like driving somewhere, and you know." And she was lovely. She she had real questions about how the industry worked. She had questions about about her career path, about my career path. And I was happy to answer those because I felt like she really valued my time and like she was, um, she was actually looking for information as opposed to just trying to sell me who she was. And I think that that people can always feel that if you're if you don't really care about um, if you're just trying to reach out to them because you think they can give you a job, like I I don't think writers or showrunners respond that well to that. But um, you know, most of us I, I didn't know anyone in Hollywood. I'm from the I'm from Maryland, um, you know, and so I. I would have killed to have 20 minutes on the phone with like a Buffy writer when I was starting out. And so I'm always happy to give that if, it, if I feel like it's genuinely helping someone. Yeah, so I think yeah, it's exactly. in the way that you're asking and doing it because you want to, to, to learn more and yeah. develop your skills is, is the way to go. Yeah, I, I, just to piggyback on what Liz is saying, I definitely prefer, because you know we get random messages from people I mean, there are people in our friendship circles, you know, that I have yet to write, read their scripts and give them feedback yet. So if you're just coming from the outside, it's so hard for me to say, oh yeah, I'm going to give you this time. But if, and, and, and especially, I, I think somebody is reaching out, you know, for you to like, to, to do something for them. Oh, can you come do this? Can you come produce this? And I'm more likely to be able to give you 15, 20 minutes over the phone to guide you and give you some sort of, um, um, example of what my experience was as opposed to uh, uh, you know saying that oh yes I can do this for you and then I'm not able to because I'm too busy or you know working on the show or you know doing whatever else life you know brings into the equation. The equation. And I'm gonna uh, there are two more questions I'm gonna merge into one so you can kind of pick which ones uh, that you want to answer and this is gonna be the final question of a really fun panel guys thank you so much. Um, so Raina Hardy asks, what's the one thing you wish you'd known to do after your big first big round of generals, which I think is very smart. Um, and then Kasimobi um, asks, what advice or creative hustle suggestions or hard truths do you have to share? So pick and choose and maybe just answer one of those. Um, I think the thing that I always try to say to people about being a TV writer is um, it's, if you're a really amazing writer, and you don't play that nice with, with others in the sandbox, go write movies. Um, people who are really, really amazingly talented writers who don't care that much about um, the social aspect of it or the, the community aspect of writing um, do really well writing features. And I think what people don't get about TV is that it's, um, we are literally trapped in a room for like 10 hours straight with the same six people, you know, your phone, you know, your computer. And so if somebody is like not a great hang, it can ruin this the whole season. It can it, like, like in a normal office, you can walk away and go to your cubicle for a minute and like get a break, but in a, in a TV room, you can't. And so when I'm reading to staff, I always, if they're gonna be an amazing script, but if I have a meeting with a person and I don't seem like they're gonna be um, a, a team player in the writer's room who I wanna spend eight hours a day with, with no access to the outside world, I don't care if it's the best script I've ever read, I'm not gonna hire them. So I think um, just the piece of advice that people don't have is they'll, they'll come into meetings and they'll be like, I've won these 10 competitions and I have a master's from USC and here's all the proof that I'm the best writer you've ever read. I'm like, I can rewrite your, your script if it's not great. I can't rewrite your personality if it's not great. So I think the one thing to remember going to generals, going to showrunner meetings, going to even your first PA job is just um, what you're trying to prove if you wanna be a TV writer is that not only are you a good writer, but, but more importantly, you're a good person that people wanna be around, people wanna spend their whole day with, um, who's gonna make, the experience of group working more fun and more energetic and more pleasant. I think um, to answer the question of like the advice you can give, like, I think the one thing is, is that like, and the hard truth is that like, you'll learn that this business is not fair, right? Like, I mean, we all know that, but like you will see writers who aren't nice people or better writers than you who like rise to the top. You'll, you'll get passed over for things. People will like, tr unfortunately try to backstab you. The only thing you can control in this business is what you create. So constantly keep writing. Like, don't, like whenever I have friends who are like, I haven't staffed and you know, I'm like, did you write a new pilot this season? Did you write something else? Um, when I couldn't get work, I wrote a novel and it like changed everything. So I think it's like, like it, it's hard. And sometimes like, I'll be annoyed. Cause I'll be like, I've written so much and I'm still here and I want to be here. 
And then I'm like, but that doesn't matter. Like, it's about what the work is and like, I can control that. And so I think that's the thing that like, whenever I get, even during this whole pandemic, I just finished a new pilot. Like nobody was asking for it. Like I've written enough sample, like, but I knew I needed to stay busy and stay motivated and stay excited. And it's not to say I woke up every day and like wrote like, you know, but I did write, try to write like a few hours a week when, I, you know, when I was, fe when I was feeling it. And so I think that's the thing too, like, especially for the people on here who are like, starting lower, you know, like lower levels or starting out, like this is your time. Like everybody has time to like write something. So like when it's all over, you can say, I made the most of that. I think that's really important. Oh, yes. Amen to that because <laughs> there's going to be such a call for content after we get up out of this. Like this is so the time. And just to piggyback off what Holly just said, um, uh, Jamie Wooten, who was a writer, um, who used to be Mark Cherry's partner when he was on the Golden Girls and he wrote on Half and Half. Um, the hard truth that he gave me when I first started interning for Yvette on that show, I'm not even gonna say how many years ago, he said, writers write. There are a lot of people who say they wanna be writers, who are aspiring writers, who wanna at some point get into the writer's room, but it's like, if you don't write, I don't believe you. And that's the biggest difference between the people who are um, in the rooms who are staffed, who are successful, you know, to this day. Again, there are some people who are successful who aren't really that good, but <laughs> it is what it is. It's unfair, like she said. But um, that's 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 the cold heart truth. Writers write, so yeah, yeah. I think um, I'll echo that too. Um, just do the work, um, but not just writing. Um, get out there and like network with people. Um, your managers and your agents can only do so much. Um, I've always gotten my own jobs uh, because of my relationships. And this is a business about relationships. And it, it, you will get your next job mostly of, because of like who you know. Um, so it is, yes, 100% about writing, but it's also like, don't be an asshole. Um, and I think, yes, there are a lot of assholes in this industry, but we're changing. We're trying to change the tide. And I think the new people that are coming up um, are, are tired of that, you know, and I think, um, just be a lovely person, just uh, do the work. Um, and then I think, you know, just keep updating your stuff. Like, I think that there's a lot of people that have like really old samples and, um, just keep up to date. Um, and I think, you know, just be nice, be a nice person. <laughs> That's all I have to say. I have, um, one hard truth too, which I think is also that like, um, so it might take a while. Like for me, like I, I think I came out and like once I started working in college, once I came out to LA and started working in college, I felt out of college. I started to feel like, well, you know, like I'll get on a show, I'll work on it as an assistant for a season, I'll get a freelance, I'll get staffed. And like, that didn't happen. Like I was like, it'll be like three years. And it was like many, many more years than that. And there's like a lot of like ups and downs and like taking jobs that you thought you'd never have to take again. And it just like, for some people it does happen quickly. And for some people it happens like really, really, really slowly. And like, it, it's like oftentimes a marathon and it's like, if you stick with it, um, like it'll probably happen at a certain point. Um, that's not true, like across the board, but someone once told me like, at a certain point it is about like being one of the people that like, if you really want to do this, like still doing it and it'll happen. Um, so yeah, it just might not happen quickly. Yeah, mine is very similar to that. It's, um, you know, just to persevere. And part of your job as a writer in the writer's room every day, your job is to go in there and fail because you're going to be pitching ideas and some of them land, some of them don't, and that's okay. So you have to be kind to yourself. You have to give yourself a break. You know, I'm the worst at this because I'm a recovering perfectionist. And so I always wanted everything to be great every single time. And it's not going to be like that. And there were times when I was trying to finally get that first break and I was uh, you know applying to all these fellowships and I was always a finalist but I never was able to break through and you just get down on yourself so much but you al always have to find that reservoir within yourself and if you can't find it within yourself find it within your circle of friends who are able to help build you back up so that you can get in there and fight some more. 
This has been really powerful. And I think the thing I would just want to end it with is we all should go out and really support our public library and play with all of the digital opportunities that we have to connect because uh, there's a real opportunity for us to disappear into beautiful content. And um, I am leaving very inspired and grateful for the time by all of you fabulous writers and to Emily for putting this together. Thank you so much for having us, Emily. Thank you so much for being here. I just thought I'd pop back on to say thank you to everyone. I hope that uh, eventually I'll be able to have you back in the library and give you thank you chocolates for doing this like I like to do. Um, and some of you can join us when that happens. Um, and then to just throw another pitch and go out and get your library card as I posted in the chat, all of Holly's books are available on overdrive with your library card. Um, there are, if you're graphic novel fans, I know a couple of people on the panel are, for example, a bunch of Walking Dead graphic novels and Riverdale graphic novels are actually available on Hoopla and plenty of others, so you can get those. Um, and then the other thing I forgot to mention is actually the classes that are available with your library card. Um, so you have access to things like Universal Class and Lynda.com, so you can do things like learning how to edit or taking, you know, leadership courses or time management courses or, you know, working on your confidence with those courses. So that can be um, a really great resource and even creative writing classes as well. So I hope you take advantage of that and let us know if you have any um, questions or need any help. And thank you all again for coming and we will uh, see you, you, you know, next time. Bye everyone. Bye. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you so lovely. much for having us. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Yeah, this is so fun.